what people want. Not only do you have to find out what people want, you also have to ask them. You have to survey them. Then you have to, next slide, research your competition. This is important. Research your competition. Have a look and see. Let's say that you do pass the success formula. You find out what people want. And what they want, you can actually give them. That's a good way to start, don't you think? What do you do then? Well, you know what they want on your website. They know they don't want all the flashing bells and whistles. They don't want big graphics that download. They don't want this. They don't want that. What they do want is good, solid information. Some how-to information, perhaps. Some training on how to get better use out of the products they've purchased from you. Information on new products, updates, specials, perhaps a forum. Frequently asked questions, answers. You need to find out what they want. Then the next thing you do is you go and research your competition. How do you do that? Just go to any search engine and type in what someone else, you've seen the results from Word Tracker Overture, what someone's looking for, and pick the top 10 websites. Have a quick glance at them yourself. Have a good look over them. Find out what they're offering. And then what you do, let's say you have a customer database, is you go and you go and find the customers that you love and they love you. You want to get 10, at least 10, perhaps minimum half a dozen people who are your customers who are not going to go to your competition no matter how, how good the competition is, they're going to stay with you. And you ask them to review the competition websites for you. Here's the rule. Don't ask your friends. Don't ask your family. You want the truth. Remember that. I know. Hey, sounds nice. But you want the truth. You want people to be hard if necessary. Get them to check out the competition to tell you what they love and what they hate. And just jot all this down. Keep a little stash file, what I call a swipe file, all this information together. This is part of the research. It only takes a couple of days. It doesn't have to take long. This isn't a one-month, 30-day, 60-day, six-month project. Forget about that. This is quick. If you're doing it yourself, you can do the entire thing in half an hour. But ask folks to research your competition for you. And once they've done that, they come back to you with what they love, what they hate. Take it into account. Remember, you want to listen to them, not to you, to them. They are your customers. Next slide. Number three of the three-step formula is to create your product or your website that meets the needs of your customers. I cannot iterate that more strongly. It meets the needs of your customers, not your needs, not your husband's or wife's needs, not your staff's needs, not your suppliers, but your customers. And you'll know this now because of the research you've done on what they want and what your competition does and what they love and hate about it. Create the product of the website that meets the needs of your customers. Now, when you're dealing with a website designer or a web design company, often they will ask you what you want. i got to tell you, and I don't know how else to say this, I don't care what you want when it comes to a website. I want to know what your customers want. Do you get the point? That's how important it is. Do you want your website to succeed beyond your expectations or to crawl along? You've got to know what people want. Create your product or create your website so that it meets the needs, the wants, desires of your customers. Based on all of the research that you've done, do that and you will be miles ahead of everyone. And a question just came to mind. Someone asked me this in a recent workshop. They said, how about the logo? You know, ever come across a website before where they've got these really big logos? Do you know the ones that I mean? These huge logos and they open up and the whole main page is nothing but a logo. Well, if your customers want that, fine. Let me, let me, let me say it to this way. It's one of my pet hates. If you want that, you better ask your customers. Chances are I think you'll find that none of them want it. Not one single person. See, the logo makes you feel good. It makes your graphics designer feel good. Hey, check out my logo. No. Do it for your customers. Next slide. Here we go. Step four of the three-step formula. I couldn't fit it into three steps. It had to be four steps. 
Step four, market it to a database. Once your website's up, once it's running, you want to market it to a database. Now, how do you do that? What database? Take a moment now and just jot down three different databases that you could possibly market it to. Let me give you some help. Number one is your existing customer database. Now, they know you're working on this project anyway, don't they? Of course. Your existing customer database. There's one. How about another one? Uh, your prospective customer database, your prospects. You, you have one of those, I hope. A list of people who want to buy from you but just haven't yet because they're not quite sure, not yet confident. So there's another database for you. How about this? Let's say you have a product or service that my customers might like, but it's not something that I personally sell. How about my customer database? What do you think of that? You would simply access. Now, you won't get access to my database, but hey, if I like your product, if I've had a look at it, tested it, tried it out, smelled it, stayed in it, if it's an accommodation house, driven it, if it's a car, picked it up, if it's a pen, used it, whatever it is, eaten there, if it's a restaurant, let's say that I've done that and I really, really like it. And I can refer my customers to you. It's called a joint venture. And there's an entire section in these discs on joint venture marketing, but I've got to tell you, it's beautiful. Marketing to a database will eventually become 95% of what you do, and it will cost you nothing. Well, next to nothing. A little bit of time, perhaps a little bit of money. If you want to do it, if you want to do it uh, offline, and you can do it offline, and perhaps if you're just getting started, you just might have to do it offline, but believe me, there are some wonderful databases online that you can access through joint venture marketing. It may cost you a little bit if you do it offline, but it doesn't have to. The point is this, the rules with database marketing, never market, this is, we're talking about email marketing here, and again, there's an entire section on that here, but never market to a database unless they've asked to be on it and they expect to receive things. Opt-in email marketing. Never, ever market to a database, an email database, or any database for that matter, unless the people who are receiving the stuff have asked to be on it and expect to receiving the stuff. All right, does that make sense to you? Because your, your hit rate, and what we're going here is for conversion rates that are good. We don't want a 0.003% conversion rate. We want a 3%, a 5%. I've even had as high, this will crack you up, as high as 85%, 84.7 it was, with one campaign I did to my own database. Oh boy, I'd like to get those kinds of numbers again. It was just a, a freak of nature. No, it wasn't. I followed the formula. These are some of the things that you need to consider. Next slide. So let me ask you this. How do you measure your website's success? How do you do that? Is it the uh, the traffic to your website? If you get 100,000 people to your site you know, next month, is that good? Does that make your website successful? What about search engines? How about if you get top position on, I don't know, half a dozen different phrases? Number one, two, or three position. They're all good enough. It doesn't have to be number one. One, two, or three is fine. First page, good. Does that measure your success? What about the bandwidth? The bandwidth is, of course, the the amount of files that get downloaded through your website. I I, I have, I don't know, just through the PaulBars.com website, I must have uh, seven or eight gigabytes of bandwidth every month. That's massive. It's because of all the audio work that I do. Remember, I can't set up in the website. It could come through there. How about the newsletter subscribers? How many newsletter subscribers do you have? Do you have 500, 1,000, 50,000? 500,000? Are they all 100% opt-in? How do you measure your website's success? Click over the next slide and I'll tell you exactly how. There are, and I'm going to read this for you. I want you to see, I want you to understand. You've read it already. There are only two ways to measure your website's success. It's profits or it's leads. If you have a lead generation website like we covered earlier on and you get... 30 high quality leads in a month that you can convert 15, 20, 50% sales with your real estate business, for example. That's how you can measure your success. If it's an e-commerce site and you're physically taking the order online and it's cost you $50,000 to set up, but you're only making two or $3,000 in sales every month, that's not successful. 
But if it costs you $1,500 to set up and you make $20,000 in the first weekend, that's successful. How do you measure it? Only two ways. I don't care how much traffic you get, and you shouldn't care either. Traffic is not the measure of success. It is simply a number that will drop down through the funnel. Okay? It's measured by numbers. The numbers tell the whole story. The numbers of the profit that you make. See, I, I might only get 5,000 visitors to a site in any given month, but still might make ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 from that site. To me, that's successful because it doesn't cost me anything to run the silly thing now it's up and running and made its profit in the first weekend. yee What more do you want? That's success. Next slide. I want to just quickly go through some of the different points that are worthwhile considering. These are some of the things that you can ask in terms of what should or should not be on your website. The logo, I think I covered that. One of my pet things, especially if you're on a slow internet connection. Please, folks, if you're going to have a logo, keep it small. Don't make it the whole page when people arrive. There's no other way to explain it. The design. The design is the look, the layout, the feel, the structure of the page. The colors that are used and so on. Simple rule of thumb, and these are just simple points. You can jot them down in notes yourself there. The design, whatever it looks like on that front page, please keep the design the same throughout. Okay, keep it the same throughout. Not a hard thing to do. Don't let it be different all the way along. Link structure. Now, the link structure, again, is part of the design, but again, it's very important. You have to build and will have your website built to the lowest common denominator. That meaning the person who's got no clue about how to use the internet. So if your links are on that left-hand side, on the front page, then you want to make sure they're on the left-hand side, on the second, third, fifth, fiftieth, one hundredth page. Keep all the links in the same place. Okay, keep all the links in the same place. And keep in mind, if you're going to be using, you know, those wonderful what's called JavaScript links, which is a little drop-down buttons and menus and the little trees and the folders and they open up and all this kind of thing. This is really good. I mean, it's okay. We can pretty well all read that online now with our updated web browsers. But the search engine robots that go through your site will not read them. They will not index them. They will not spider them. And if they do, chances of you happen to get found are pretty few and far between. So keep some, always keep some good old-fashioned HTML, good old-fashioned text links on your website. These are points for you to consider. So when someone's building your website, you know what they're doing, and you know when they're about to, you know, use the phrase, screw you, because they're looking for a, a fast, they wanted to, they, when someone else builds your website, they're looking for the fastest possible option to get that job in and out. Instead, what you want to do is make sure they do the right thing by you, not just by them. The sales copy on the website, please make sure you do have sales copy. Make sure you've got sales copy. These are the words, the phrases throughout the page, the information pages, the sales pages that create emotion and entice people to either buy or contact you. Be either e-commerce sales website or lead generation. Words create emotion. Unless you're in the adult industry, images will not sell better than words. And people will tell you differently. Images can enhance the words. Nice multimedia slideshow presentations or the rotating 3D images of a property being sold, an accommodation, a holiday location. They can enhance the words, but on their own, they're not going to do the job. You need to make sure that you have good, solid sales copy on your information pages. Next slide. More points to consider. Your multi-databasing methods. Okay, multi-databasing, I refer to this in the email marketing section. Have more than one list. It doesn't matter whether there's only 20 people on, you know, 20 people on one contact database. If you have seven or eight of them and they're all high quality prospects in a dozen or more different databases, that's fine. Target your people with your follow up information. Target them. Don't just send stuff willy nilly. Always be sure to send exactly what people want when they want it, when they're expecting it, what they've asked for. And you can do this easier with multi databasing rather than 
just having one massive big contact email list for everybody. Okay, let's look at location ones, for example. Here in Australia, you could have one by state by state. Heck, you could do it anywhere, actually. I just do it. One state by state. And the privacy policy. Now, that's a good one. Privacy policy. We need to have, you need to have a privacy policy on your website. If you're collecting people's information and you're going to be sending them stuff, you want to let them know what you're going to do with their information and who else you're going to share it with. Hopefully, nobody. You don't want to share it with anybody. You want to keep it to yourself, tight and secure. Let them know that. Let them know that they can unsubscribe from your mailings at any time, should they choose. Make some fun out of it. Tell them, look, I hope you won't unsubscribe, but if you do, here's how you do it. Let them know they can contact you without fear of their email address being sold. Let them know that you're using a secure server for your processing of orders, that their credit card details are safe. All part of your privacy policy. Product images. Now, in this particular case, I'm referring to a graphical representation of your image. Let's say, uh, well, let's take the eBusiness Mastery for an example. Okay, it doesn't actually, when, when, you, when you get this thing in this little box, in this package when it arrives to you, it looks different to what it does on the web. See, the web's just a product image. It's a graphical rep representation. I'm going to suggest that you do that for almost everything that you've got. Because images, as I said, they can enhance the sales copy. But what you need to decide is, are you going to have a photograph of the item or are you going to have a graphical representation? It's just a question you need to ask. How do you find out what you need? You ask your customers. You survey people way back in the beginning. What do they want? The FWAC. Now, the FWACs are always very important. I think every website should have a FWAC. However, I would sort of strongly suggest, ah, my mouth's getting dry. I would strongly suggest that you don't put down FWAC because some people don't know what a FWAC is. Instead, spell it out, frequently asked questions. And you will get frequently asked questions. And if you don't get these things onto your website, you're going to get a dozen or more people every day emailing you the same questions. Instead, if you have these questions on your website, and of course the answers, that's kind of important, you'll save yourself a lot of time and effort and your customers will appreciate it. All right, next slide. Let's look at the contact details. This is a beautiful one. So many people, I don't know why, 